Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. I am joined today by Rick Gates. Uh, Rick is a formal political consultant, a lobbyist. He served as a key aide to the Trump campaign in 2016, working alongside Paul Manafort and Kellyanne Conway. Uh, Rick is also known for his role in the Mueller investigation, uh, which was investigating ties between the Trump campaign and Russia. In October 2017, Rick was charged alongside Manafort with money laundering. He pled guilty to lying to investigators and became a star witness of sorts, um, you know, cooperating with the investigation that led to Manafort's conviction, as well as the conviction of Roger Stone, a longtime advisor to President Trump. Uh, as part of his plea deal, Rick was sentenced to 45 days in jail and three years of probation, I believe. Rick is now out with a new book called Wicked Game, where he seeks to tell his side of the story. And he dives deep into some of the topics we'll discuss here today, um, including what happened in 2016, what happened with the Mueller investigation, but also the consequences of the polarization and, and rancor that's dividing our country. Um, and I wanted to talk to Rick because I think he has a unique and um, likely interesting perspective on that after being sort of in the heat of everything and now in some ways being on the other side. Um, so Rick, it's quite a tale I bet you have to tell, but thank you so much for coming on and, be, and being on the Braver Angels podcast. Karen, thanks very much for having me. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too. So before we dive into the past four years, um, let's back up a bit. Tell our listeners a little bit about your background and why you decided to get involved with the Trump campaign in 2016. Sure, it's, uh, my, my career in politics started in kind of 1994 when I worked for uh, the lobbying firm that Paul Manafort was a partner of, although I had only met him once uh, and actually didn't meet him again until 2006 when I went to replace his partner, Rick Davis, who went mm -hmm. for, uh, to work for the John McCain campaign. So I've uh, kind of always been in and out of politics, uh, a good part of it uh, on the international side. Um, and then I spent some time working both uh, on the Bob Dole for president campaign and the George Bush uh, for president campaign. So it was a, it's, it's been an interesting road to see not only how we approach politics in the United States, but also have been uh, given the opportunity to look at uh, the perspective from uh, different countries around the world, which has been really neat. Cool. And so what was it that attracted you to the Trump campaign, obviously, when Trump first announced his candidacy, he was not an establishment Republican. You know, he was viewed as a, a long shot, a disruptor, a populist, some might say. Um, you know, what made you want to get involved with the, the Trump campaign rather than, say, the, the Jeb Bush campaign or the Marco Rubio campaign? Yeah, so truth be told, I was uh, actually on my way out of politics. Uh, Paul had called me in January of 2016 and said that he would uh, like me to put together some research on the Republican primaries and the delegate process. He didn't tell me what it was for, who it was for. Uh, and I did that and about three weeks later, he said, okay, we're, uh, we're gonna go see Donald Trump. Um, and I knew right then and there that Paul had uh, been approached um, by a couple of people that uh, were around Mr. Trump at the time. And the idea at that, at that time, if you may recall, was that there was gonna be a contested convention. Uh, mm -hmm. 16 and there was you know the media had just gone into overdrive about it and we actually haven't had a contested contested convention in this country uh since uh you know ford and reagan um back in uh, 76 i believe and paul was one of the few people that had actually been at that convention and run the delegate operation so he was perfectly positioned to kind of take on this role with donald trump and so did you guys go in then for a in-person meeting with the president Yes, Paul went first to meet with uh, Mr. Trump down at Mar-a-Lago, and then within three days he was hired and we were both brought up to New York and we started working out of uh, Trump Tower in the campaign headquarters. Gotcha. And I mean, that must have been a pretty, you know, quick development. All of a sudden you're in the middle of the campaign for president and you're working for Donald Trump. Um, I guess, what was your impression when you were thrown into that? I mean, what was your impression of the president, his policies, his agenda? What was it that attracted you to the work? 
Sure. I, I thought, you know, at first, uh, and I didn't really know Donald Trump up to this point. Uh, I, I knew Paul's firm had done some work. Roger Stone had done some work um, with him in prior years. But this was the first kind of exposure I had. And immediately you're, you're taken with kind of how he approaches things from a very non-political way. And the more that I got to spend time with him and learn about him, the more it was just amazing to see a person kind of, 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 of this position in terms of not being a politician uh, come up through the ranks um, of, of beating the, not just his uh, opponent Hillary Clinton, but the Republican party itself in order to get the nomination, which is uh, I think one of the most fascinating parts that I had the opportunity to experience. And then just through that process, watching him develop in, into uh, something that the people were craving for. And I think that's, you know, to kind of, you know, as we get into it, um, you know, his campaign resonated just unbelievably, like people from all walks of America that you wouldn't expect. And it was just a sense of, I think, harbored anger at, at political establishments, political parties, politicians, um, you know, at the time Donald Trump was running, uh, Congress had a 13% approval rating and mm. it didn't really, you know, get, get much better over the years. And, 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 and it was just a, it was almost a reaction. And here was the person that could start a movement that people really wanted to embrace because they were just tired of politics. Gotcha. And, and so as you were deciding whether or not to take on the work, did you have any, you know, reservations based on anything Trump had said or some of the, you know, folks he was associating with? No, at, the, not, at, at that time, absolutely not. I mean, when you go through uh, political races, I mean, the thing I think most people forget is candidates are humans, you know, our, our leaders are humans. And they're not infallible. And, and everybody makes mistakes along the way. We all learn from our mistakes. And so there wasn't, uh, you know, any resident. He, what I think drove me and other people to him is the way that he approached everything. He was very open. He put everything on the table. Whether you agree with him or not is, is not really, you know, the, the, the point that I'm trying to drive home. I, I have faith in the American people and everybody will decide who they support and, and, and not support. But from the perspective of what Donald Trump was br to bring to the table, it was so unique and genuine and authentic. And we had never had that you know, for quite some time. I mean, even Reagan would probably be the last, I think, president that people would say, you know, was a great communicator, could really reach out to the people. But even he went through, you know, a political career before he got to the presidency. Right. So all of a sudden you're kind of, you know, catapulted to the, the front lines of American politics in the heat of a, a presidential race. Um, and I actually worked on the Obama campaign in, in 2012 and headquarters. And then I was on the Clinton campaign in, in 2016. So, you know, we, we ultimately had the defeat, but, you know, that is to say, I know a little bit about what the, the campaign mentality and mindset is, even if I probably wasn't as, as senior as you were. So you're at the top of the campaign, you're, you're working alongside Manafort, he's the campaign manager. And then all of a sudden, you know, if my recollection, recollection served me correctly, there are some news stories that start to come out uh, about Manafort's uh, financial dealings in Ukraine and elsewhere. And then he is summarily removed as campaign manager. Um, I guess, tell me a little bit about what was that like? Uh, did that sort of come out of the blue? And how did you guys respond? Sure. It, you know, there was a buildup starting in April when Paul joined the campaign, you know, a month earlier in March. And some articles had started appearing about his work uh, you know, overseas in a number of international jurisdictions. And, you know, it was interesting, some of the headlines early on when Paul came to the Trump campaign is it was treated a lot more seriously because he was, you know, I guess deemed as one of the first real political operatives that had, you know, kind of come on board uh, the campaign and was giving it structure, legitimacy, credibility, along with, you know, uh, Mr. Trump winning, you know, almost every primary during that period of time. So all of a sudden it kind of went from this idea of people not really giving, you know, Mr. Trump a chance to uh, it being an absolutely credible campaign being led by somebody that had a lot of political experience. So the, you know, as, as um, anybody might appreciate when you get into that position, uh, you know, people that aren't favorable toward you or that candidate uh, start coming after you. And so it was a slow buildup into um, uh, a number of articles that appeared. And, uh, you know, now we have the benefit of, of hindsight 
Um, and certainly much more material has been able to come out over the last three years uh, versus when Paul was hit with it right in August of 2016. Uh, but there was one article that uh, you're referring to which referenced Paul had taken, uh, I think about 12 million in cash, uh, which uh, the New York Times reported, um, which we knew was not true. I, I, mean, I don't know if anybody's ever seen 12 million in cash before, but it's not like you just get up and walk out with suitcases. So it was really, uh, a, a disparaging story that that really knocked him off of um, you know the, the the helm of the Trump campaign, and you know obviously it had been debunked you know uh, some time later, but it was enough for you know his opponents, his enemies, to really go after him because the the thinking at that time was to try to and it wasn't just Paul but others that they were attacking to try to eliminate them. Uh, from you know having these political operatives and consultants that knew what they were doing to really come in and kind of help you know Mr. Trump push through. Right, but you know you knew and I suppose still know Manafort for a long time. I mean you were associated with the, the firm back in the day, Black Manafort and Stone, which I think was you know kind of legendary in Washington for uh, creating modern lobbying and. You know, obviously, when you're working for a firm, you're always kind of weighing uh, ethical considerations with financial prospects. Um, in terms of that whole period, um, had you ever gotten a sense that, um, you know, there may have been some misdealings or some things you weren't comfortable with? Or did this sort of just strike you out of the blue? No, some of it at that time was um, absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you know, one of the mistakes I think Paul made in hindsight is, um, you know, the media that he dealt with during most of his presidential campaigns is much different from the media today. And Paul had taken kind of an absence from American politics for a number of years uh, and had done a lot of, you know, international races. Uh, and then when he came back into the into the Trump campaign, you know, 2016, the media uh, just completely changed to social media, digital media. And he had not really, you know, uh, kept up with it, participated in it. And to a large extent, he applied tactics that he used in previous presidential campaigns um, and thought that, for example, the articles would just go away. Uh, you don't want to be a distraction to the candidate. So you don't, you know, respond or you don't fight back. And I think that was a mistake because there was a lot of material that came out uh, that was just factually not true. Um, some of it he pushed back on, others, you know, he didn't. He just decided that he would let the story die. And ultimately that started to build. And in sure, when you take uh, a number of the campaigns that he's worked on overseas and then prior, you know, to the work that he did at Black Manafort, you know, before, you know, I was there, um, it, it, it builds up into, you know, kind of this reputation uh, that he has worked for, you know, a number of, you know, interesting people around the world. And a lot of that really came back, I think, to haunt him. I think one of the most telling things for me is, um, you know, working for the firm, uh, I had read some of the newspaper articles, you know, when I had worked in 1994, and then I didn't see Paul again until 2006. But when a lot of this information came out, I was just kind of of the opinion, but this is old news. And somebody said to me, but Rick, you don't understand. You know, there's a whole generation of people now that are younger that had no idea of some of the work that, you know, Paul did overseas or in the U.S. So for them, this is kind of their first time seeing it. And at that point, it kind of dawned on me that, yeah, Paul probably needed to do a much better job at managing the media. And especially, you know, with Mr. Trump, who obviously, you know, is, is, a, is a master of the media. There was a little issue there with respect to, um, I, I don't think, you know, uh, President Trump, um, you know, really understood why Paul didn't fight back. Because you, hmm. his world, you fight, fight, fight. And Paul didn't want to be a distraction. And I think that created a huge uh, problem for Paul, which ultimately led to his, his ouster. Hmm. And so what exactly was the wrongdoing for which you and Paul were charged? Yeah, so the principal re uh, was FARA, which is a, um, uh, an obscure law that was uh, set up in, during World War II. It's called the uh, Fe uh, Federal, uh, excuse me, Foreign Registrations Act. And it basically says that you need to register if you work on the behalf of any type of foreign country in the context of doing that work in the United States. When Paul originally did for his first part of the work in Ukraine, it was actually running political elections over in Ukraine. So there was no re re reason to register. 
It wasn't until the election of 2010 and Viktor Yanukovych, uh, when he became the president, that Paul started working back in the United States to some of uh, the people at State Department and, uh, and other people you know, on Capitol Hill. And that's what really triggered uh, the provision um, that ultimately the special counsel deemed he violated. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a, it's, it's a, it's an obscure law, you know, obviously they used it uh, maliciously uh, in, in the special counsel's investigation. I think everybody ended up having some form of fair charge uh, associated with them. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's kind of hard to put it into context because, Karen, if you look at it, there were probably about, you know, eight to 10 people that all were involved in, in kind of this entire lobbying operation. And everybody was allowed to uh, retroactively file uh, under the FARA law and not, you know, uh, deal with any consequences. And uh, unfortunately, Paul and I were the only two that were ultimately, you know, brought up on it. I see. So I think, you know, the popular understanding is that there was some, uh, you know, money laundering and or tax evasion. Are you saying that those two things are just essentially consequences of that FARA violation? Well, so Farah was uh, something that um, had, Paul had been known to be working in Ukraine since 2005. He worked with four different U.S. ambassadors. He worked with members of the State Department. And not once in that 10-year period did anybody approach him and say, hey, you might need to register for Farah. And a lot of people, you know, again, this is, you know, what we were talking about earlier, the narrative kind of spins out of control. Um, you know, there's a lot about President Yanukovych that people have just classified him as, as pro-Russian. So that meant that Paul was automatically, you know, kind of push, uh, pushing those interests. And it couldn't have been further from the truth. I mean, if people had actually looked at it in real fact and evidence in detail, they would see that, you know, President Yanukovych did not like President Putin. Uh, in fact, President Putin was supporting his opponent, uh, contributed significantly to his uh, opponent. And so all that kind of just led to the idea that, that Paul had been working uh, you know, to further Ukraine with respect to its partnership with Russia. And nobody wanted to point out that Paul had been working with a number of U.S. government uh, officials to push the American version of foreign policy of what we wanted to try to do in Ukraine. So I think that is what ultimately led to kind of, hey, let's go after him. And then obviously with the special counsel, you know, as I write in my book, that's a whole different animal. I mean, right came in and they were just looking for anything that they could find because they needed to get something on, you know, it was like, the, I call it the pyramid scheme. You know, uh, they, they try to get anybody close to the president and if they can't get them, then they start a layer lower until they can work their way up uh, to get what they need. Uh, so there were absolutely other issues that they brought to the table. Uh, the, the issue of uh, tax, uh, not paying enough in taxes, uh, filing false uh, bank accounts, uh, and then the, the Pharaoh was kind of the big hook. Gotcha. Well, yeah, so you mentioned the special counsel, and obviously the original mandate for the council was to investigate alleged ties uh, between the Trump campaign and, and Russia, and then also whether the, the president potentially obstruction, obstructed justice in his efforts to um, engage with that investigation. So what was your vantage point from from being on the campaign, obviously there were a number of documented contacts uh, between members of the Rus Russia, uh, between members of the Trump campaign and, and you know, Russian nationals, some of whom are alleged to have ties to intelligence. Um, being around that, what was the vibe? Did that just sort of seem like, you know, par for the course uh, conversations that Manafort was having with former associates? Or did you ever get a sense of, this seems a little weird. There's a lot of, uh, you know, conversations with, with Russians going on. No, and that's the thing, you know, from the campaign perspective, it was kind of absolute nonsense. And from, and we'll get into, you know, my perspective specifically with Manafort, because I thought that the, uh, look, in hindsight, the media jumped on it. And obviously it became a great story. The president, you know, I, I remember the first time we were traveling on, on his plane and the, he sees it on TV. And he couldn't understand 
the media's initial fascination with it. And because if you actually look at the historical relationship between uh, President Trump and, and President Putin, it's, there is none. I mean, they encountered each other, I think, once in 2013, briefly at the at the pageant that was held in Moscow. Uh, and then up to that point, there was nothing until some tweet exchanges, I think, in 2015, where they were basically saying, you know, oh, he would be a, a good president, you know, and and um, uh, and then, you know, President Trump, you know, tweeted back, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin's a strong leader. And that kind of started, you know, that 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 uh, ball from rolling. And then what the president saw along the way on the campaign is that the media were just so um, hysterical about it that he played into it. I mean, he absolutely, I, I like to say he baited them and he knew mm. exactly how to hook them uh, on this information. And then in terms of other people, I, you know, the, I, there are two things that have frustrated me about this entire Mueller investigation, among many. But the one principle was when we all of a sudden decide that 2016 is the election and that the Russians interfere. The Russians and other adversaries, China and North Korea, have been interfering for decades. So what have we been doing for the last 20 years when these various uh, you know, versions of interference have occurred? Why is it all of a sudden in 2016 we're saying, ah, Russian interference, let's really look into this. And we hadn't, mm -hmm. so in, in the entire time that Obama's president, what did he do to steer off Russian interference, uh, Chinese interference, or any other adversary that we had in our elections? And then secondly, is, it is no secret, I mean, the Clintons had more contacts with Russians than anybody, I think, in, in America. Between the Clinton Global Initiative, the Clinton Foundation, Bill Clinton's speech in Moscow, Hillary Clinton's speech, you know, to uh, the Ukrainian, some of the Ukrainian oligarchs in, in Yalta. It, it, there was no uh, approach where a, a map of all the Clinton connections were being made, you know, with Russians and Russian oligarchs. Uranium One. Bob Mueller delivering, you know, some of the uranium himself over to, uh, to Russia. So it... From my perspective, it was the, the media that like, kind of sunk in to Trump's position on this. Uh, and, and obviously, now that we're learning, and, and we'll find out as evidence comes out, and, and as I said, I'm a big believer in letting the evidence come out and the facts come out. Uh, I'm not saying you know, that there, there are mistakes you know, from the, the government's perspective, but with the recent revelation of uh, Mr. Brennan and his, um, you know, I guess, uh, not so quite uh, forthcoming accounts of what happened and the memos that have come out. I think it's gonna be interesting to see how much of this actually pulls back the Clinton campaign into whether or not they were involved uh, in, in any aspect of trying to drive a, a wedge between uh, the president and, um, and, and what was happening in Russia at the time. Hmm. Well, I think part of the concern too was that in some ways it appeared that the, the president was, was welcoming the inter interference or at least defending it because my understanding is Mueller charged I don't know if it was 19 Russian nationals or something in St. Petersburg of essentially directing, you know, operations online and elsewhere to try to, you know, monkey around in the uh, election. And then, you know, Trump was in Helsinki with Putin and essentially said, you know, I take Putin's word that there was no effort to do that. Um, essentially taking the word of Putin over, um, you know, what a lot of folks in the intelligence community had said. What was your reaction uh, when you saw his remarks in Helsinki? Do you think it was just sort of like a natural defensiveness of like, you know, Trump feeling attacked by the media and wanting to sort of push back? Or do you think he really, uh, you know, just believed that the entire Russian effort to do this was, was concocted? No, I think at some level he believed the intelligence services, but you also have to understand uh, going into uh, the election, he had some distrust of the intelligence services from the information that they provided in Iraq. And certainly, you know, with uh, Michael Flynn in our campaign, uh, General Flynn was a, a kind of a great, you know, proponent of what was wrong with the intelligence system. And just as we're seeing now, you know, with, with all of the documents that won't be disclosed. I mean, you know, it, it, it's no secret. The only way we're going to have a transparent democracy if this information gets out. So, you know, the question is, why are these intelligence agencies withholding this information? And so I think all this starting in the campaign and leading in today uh, has, you know, caused the president to, you know, con be concerned about the intelligence and the intelligence services. Um, I think one thing that this whole episode has shown is it's, I think, from my standpoint, it's fascinating. Look at how intelligence agencies 
um, receive and process raw data. You know, I mean, just with the, the information that was declassified last week by Director Radcliffe, I mean, it's important that people understand that while the information was passed along to our other US intelligence groups by the CIA, there was no confirmation that that information was in fact true. It was just a suspicion. It could have been, you know, Russian disinformation, but the fact that we got it into our system and then that's where it kind of carries over to the fact that, you know, Mr. Brennan actually briefed President Obama on it. So the thinking is, well, if he did that, he's probably not going to go in and brief the president on something that's not necessarily partially true. Uh, and secondly, giving it to the FBI and the FBI not doing anything with it. You know, all this <clears throat> kind of leads to the idea of what are government, you know, intelligence agencies doing? Um, and so I think that's a, a key consideration. And then the only other point I want to take here on that is the president all along his campaign, <clears throat> as I include in the book, his belief is, you know, why make enemies when you can, you can have friends if it serves the American interest? And he always said that. He said, you know, behind the scenes, you know, I'll go sit down with Putin and if we get along, great, and it helps America, great. But if it doesn't, I'll be the first to get up to the table and leave. And I think he's done that with a lot of leaders over time. And frankly, I just think that's a non-political way of doing it. He's a businessman. So if mm. you're a businessman, why wouldn't you sit down with somebody? It doesn't mean you have to do business or you'll like them or you know, that you just won't get up from the table. But this idea of archaic political thinking about, oh, we're just not gonna do that because you know, they invaded, you know, the Russians invaded Crimea in 2014. Well, yeah, they did, but, and what did President Obama do during that time? He didn't do anything after that. So it kind of, you know, his impression of the way politicians have handled foreign policy and diplomacy, uh, he thought was a very, very bad way of doing it because they made a lot of mistakes in his opinion. Mm. Yeah, no, I totally get that that argument. I wonder, though, does the president have an additional responsibility uh, to represent, you know, American ideals, right? So when Trump goes to the Philippines and is hanging out with Duterte or Trump welcomes Orban uh, to the Rose Garden, um, I get the argument that he and others are making, but is it possible that all, that also sends a message to the world uh, that you know what Duterte is doing is, um, if not fine, it's certainly not a, a deal breaker. How do you think about that consideration in terms of representing American ideals abroad? Sure, I think about it in terms of past presidencies. We had President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama. What happened with China, right? Human rights, human rights violations. And every year you go to the UN, they would do trips, you know, they would go to China, they would go to Taiwan, they would go to other places. Did they do anything? Were they able to, you know, kind of get over those issues that we had and every time they came up? So I think it's, um, it would be hypocritical to say, you know, just because President Trump is seeing some of these world leaders in that way and he approaches it differently, that it's wrong. Because certainly we've had very, very difficult, you know, issues with a number of countries over the years with people, uh, people you know, being president. And we could argue whether they've handled it or not. I personally think the approach President Trump is taking is different. It's unique. I'm not saying it's going to work, but at least he's making an effort to try to get the U.S. to a better position than we are. And that's, I think that's the underlying thing that he doesn't necessarily communicate as well. And I think if he did, people would understand what the motivation for that is. And it's mm. America at a better point. And because that doesn't come across, I think to your point, it's kind of misconstrued a lot of times. And it looks like he's hanging out, you know, with dictators that have, you know, some significant issues when in fact, I, I look at the end of the day, I think he'd be the first person to say, if he doesn't like that guy, he's out of there. And he certainly come back and said that, you know, with a couple of the world leaders around the world. But I think he wants to make a effort to try to put America in a much better position than it is. Gotcha. Well, let's dive a little bit deeper into the book. Um, What's the central thesis? What do you want Americans who are reading your book, you know, two weeks before the election in a climate that's, you know, as divisive and rancorous, at least as I can remember, I think as, as a lot of people can remember, what do you want folks to take away? Sure. I started out, you know, thinking about this book, you know, um, in, in a way to show how President Trump won in 2016, because there are a lot of people that were still in disbelief 
of how it happened. And uh, obviously, I don't think anybody or very few thought that he might have a chance of getting elected in 2016. And so there was this unique um, uh, opportunity, I felt, for somebody uh, that had been there, been in the front lines, been, you know, kind of on the front row seat to kind of just step back and not do it in a uh, in a way that was focusing on things that, in, in my opinion, didn't really matter historically or factually in, in, in terms of, you know, some of the things the president might say are, are due along the way, but step back and look at the way he ran the campaign, what, what mattered to him in the campaign, his key issues, um, and then his events along the way. And, and frankly, uh, tapping into that idea and, and stepping out as a witness and observer to showing how a non-politician can go from never holding a political office to holding the highest office in the land. And then from that, I, I was fascinated seeing the political process unfold and how the entire Republican establishment was literally against him every step of the way. And in a large respect, he had a harder time fighting the Republican Party establishment than he did Hillary Clinton in the general election. And what made it even more compelling was the fact that, guess what, on the Democratic side, it was going on with Bernie Sanders. And so this idea that our political process is broken, regardless of political party, I thought was a really interesting element to capture. And then, yes, when you add on to it the problems that I encountered with the justice system, all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it becomes this idea of let's, let's look at these problems systematically. Let's not look at them in a salacious way or, you know, let's look at them for historical purpose and value and, and get all that out there. So one day people can read back and say, yeah, how did President Trump win? That, that was really interesting. And, and instead of everybody focusing on his, his personality, his character and, and what he does or doesn't do at the moment, Nobody really captured, you know, key moments along the way that really defined how he won and then what happened after that. So I, I guess I had a new, unique perspective because I just wasn't tied to the campaign. I was in the inauguration and then obviously the Mueller probe. So it kind of expanded my ability to kind of focus on some of these topics um, and along the way, look at, you know, exactly what your organization does and the polarization of America and really um, what has happened, not just from 2016, but even further back. Um, I, I do want to make one point, you know, I, I always tend to get frustrated when people say, oh, President Trump has created this chaos. Absolutely incorrect. President Trump has not created the chaos. He's used the chaos and, he, and, and he's found ways to have that resonate with people. But the chaos has been in America for quite some time. You could even argue it went back to 2000, uh, you know, with the Bush-Gore election. That was a very, you know, divisive time in our country as well. Mm. Well, so we talked about the campaign, I guess. I'd love to get your thoughts at a high level on the last four years and the, the Trump administration and just how, you know, our politics and, and society have changed as a result of Trump's approach to governing. Sure. I think he's done uh, a, a lot of things that people will, you know, go back in history and think, wow, why did he do that? Let me say a few things. Um, from a policy perspective, he's probably done more than any other president that I can remember, maybe FDR. He, he gets through policies. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with those policies. That's a completely separate argument. But the fact that he's actually getting stuff done, uh, I think is a very refreshing uh, point. Um, obviously, people are concerned, you know, sometimes about his behavior, about his tweets. Um, again, he's not a politician. Uh, he doesn't act like one. He's always put everything out there. He tells you his feelings. Um, you know, the other argument I think people say is, you know, he, he's, he's kind of an authoritarian. Uh, I find that kind of amusing because what that tells me is for once, you know, we've actually elected a president, an individual, which is what our constitution actually calls us to do, not a committee, not a body of people that are, you know, uh, helping make the president make a decision for him. Uh, I think he's the most decisive leader that we've had since Eisenhower. And I think that there, you know, history will obviously judge over time. Um, there are things that he has been uh, really good at that he's taken and done proactively. And a lot of those are his campaign uh, promises. A lot of things that have been challenging or are the things that he's had to react to. Obviously the COVID pandemic uh, being, you know, the top one. And, and that's a hard one. Um, but again, when you kind of look at everything on his head, you look at the economy and the state of the economy, even in the pandemic, 
I mean, personally, I thought it was going to be, you know, so far worse. And here we are. And the economy is is just I'm actually amazed at how much it has rebounded. And I think that's going to play, you know, as, as kind of we probably get into the discussion of the election itself, November, and what all this, you know, kind of means, because there's a lot of people have to figure out and process, right? There, there's no question we have two visions of where America could go. And the question is, how will people, you know, make those decisions? I have absolute faith in the American people that they will, they will, and they'll go vote. And I think that's fantastic. Um, and hopefully we can do it in a more civil way than, than it has been. But there is a lot of emotional built up from decades. This is not, that's why I want to make a point. This is not from 2016, or I mean, yes, it has increased, but that's only because the stakes have gotten that much greater. Right. Well, I think, you know, on the left, aside from, you know, the policies they disagree with or the tweets they find maddening, I think one of the things that's that's most troubling for, for liberals about the Trump administration is the way he tries to stoke division. Mm -hmm. Obviously, our country is very divided and as a president, I think your mandate is to try to represent all Americans and to unify Americans where you can. Um, but I think a lot of people see Trump's approach as kind of divide and conquer uh, and to try to pit people against one another, even within his own White House, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about that argument? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily buy into it, although I think there are elements of it that um, you could absolutely make an argument that do exist. I mean, again, he's not a politician. He never was. Um, he's a CEO. When you look at the what a CEO does, I mean, while you may not be thinking of many politicians that act the way that you just suggested, I guarantee you there are a lot more CEOs that do that. And again, so his training, what he learned, his skill set have, have all kind of come you know, from that realm. And what he's done is bring all that over into politics, which is frustrating from the left, sometimes from the right. Again, I mean, he didn't have a lot of support going into the election in 2016. Uh, I, you know, when we first joined the campaign, I, I could count the, on one hand the number of uh, kind of sitting politicians that were supporting him. And so when you, when you have that mindset, when you come into that, you're not thinking like a politician because the one thing he's not is politically correct. And I really think that's part of where you're, you're kind of driving to on, on what people think is as politically correct. Um, as a president, any president should try to lead our nation in the right way. And I think President Trump feels compelled to the people that brought him to office, um, that voted for him, uh, based on the messages that he went out and, and they re and resonated with them, that he feels like to his base that he needs to really continue um, you know, his, his presidency in that way. And, I, you know, look, he, the, the one thing that I will say is his instincts are unparalleled, you know, even in the midst of campaign, the administration, what's happening now, the one thing you can't say is he hasn't changed. Um, you know, and, and I think people were a little surprised at some of the stuff that he did along the way in the administration, but that's exactly what he's done during the campaign as well. He, he, mm. he who he is. And, and there's a lot of respect for that. I think a lot of people, um, have a, a, um, a belief that that is, I'd rather know that and, and know that you might send out a bad tweet than hear you get up and say what you think I want to hear and then go away and not do anything, you know, really about it. Um, there's right. Improvement, though. Yeah, because I think at Braver Angels, one of the things we try to emphasize is that there's a difference between, you know, good faith disagreement on one hand and pure enmity on the other. And so I think sometimes people are concerned, you know, even just using the word enemies. Tr Trump likes to throw that word around a lot. Um, we just commissioned a poll with YouGov that came out this week that shows 56% uh, of Americans, both Democrats and Republicans, expect to see uh, an increase in violence as a result of the election. Um, and obviously there's no ideology that has a monopoly on violence. Um, but when you look at which of our leaders are, you know, as I said, stoking division, using words like en uh, enemy, um, you know, f you say not politically correct. Others would say kind of flirting with some, some violent rhetoric. 
What, what do you think that does to people's um, mindset, just given how fierce our disagreements are? Sure. Look, it's a great question. First, I, I applaud you guys for what you're doing because there's no question from, you know, prior to 2016, where I think all this anger and, and unrest had been building up to 2016, when a lot of these people felt they finally found somebody that they could actually support that would champion, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that sentiment to today, it is increasingly become divided and, 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 and divisive uh, on policy. Um, on on personality, uh, on the on the direction, the future direction of this country. Now, no question, America is the greatest country in the world. The fact that we're even being able to discuss this and discuss other people, you know, uh, arguing is great. It, it shows us that you know our democracy is alive and vibrant. The vi there's no place for violence. There's no need for violence. And I, I think that, you know, the, while the president has condemned, you know, a lot of that violence over time, the Democrats have done a good job of kind of staying on him for that. Because the, the, one of the things that I, I learned about the president is he actually um, has more in his head than he actually uses in his words. And, it, and sometimes there are uh, moments where I can see that he is going to say more, you know, but he stops. And then people... And unfortunately, our media does this too. They take something and they just run with it. You know, so for example, if I ask you who you're going to support and you say, you know, I haven't decided yet, then I could come out and say, oh, you don't support, you know, Trump. You don't support Clinton. That's not true. But so we've gotten into this uh, unfortunate, you know, environment where we're not listening to each other. We're just taking what we believe to be true and correct and what we want and then trying to drive that down, you know, everybody else's, you know, um, um, you know, kind of psyche. And, and I think that's that's wrong. I, I do want to see us get to a point where we can talk about politics uh, in neighborhoods, in, in, in families. I mean, I, I'm just I'm blown away even before 2016, how many people are getting upset, you know, about politics. And we're doing a huge disservice to future generations. Uh, hmm. Our kids, our you know, college students, they need to they need to be able to p participate in the political process, and we need to give them the tools to be able to do it. If there's anything that I would you know be a, a, a champion for and passionate about, it's political tolerance, especially as we, we move forward. The election of 2020 is not going to change our country, and we're not going to go back to, you know, 1900, where everything, you know, seems, you know, fine and great, and everybody's on the same page. I think we're in a position now, just given everything that's happened, not just in our country, but in the world, where we're just becoming more divisive, and, and, and people have different opinions, and we're just not able to accept people's opinions. And that's where we, if we can bridge that, then I think we can get back to a, a place where we can still have different opinions and, and feel you know, strongly about and passionate about different issues, but at least talk with each other about it. Because the one component that we're, we're losing from this is learning from each other. Totally. And that's very much in line with, you know, as you know, what we seek to do. So you mentioned November. Obviously, we have a pretty important election coming up. Um, what is the choice facing the American people between Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Sure, I think the choice is actually really clear. It's two different visions. And again, whether you agree with the policies or not of each one, um, you know, every American has to go in and say, okay, I think Donald Trump or Joe Biden can lead this country forward. And, you know, there are, what I will say is I think, you know, the, the obviously the two main issues that really are going to dominate, I think when people go into the polling stations are the economy, and then COVID, and, and obviously what is going you know, to be done uh, no matter who is the next president as we get closer to a vaccine, for example. But I think those issues are gonna weigh on Americans' minds you know, quite substantially. Um, but there's no, I mean, there, there is a very, very clear difference both in obviously personalities, uh, in, in policies, um, in, in goals and, and, and just values in terms of how you will lead America into the future. And um, obviously the great thing about an election is we get to have a voice. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what the American people decide to do, um, especially, you know, now, you know, the one thing that, that uh, you know, President Trump didn't have in 2016 was a record, right? Um, and it was very easy 
to uh, honestly, you know, attack uh, Hillary Clinton on her record because she had such a long and, and kind of disastrous one. But when you don't have a record, you kind of, you know, are in a much better position. And so this time around with policies, with issues that have come up, um, you know, it's definitely put, you know, the Trump campaign in a position of where they ha now have to defend certain things. Uh, and, and they're doing a good job with it, I think, to a large extent. Obviously, the economy is is going well. And I think that, look, in every presidential election, with the exception of probably 2004, you know, because of 9-11 and national security became the, the paramount issue, economy is what people care about, you know? So if, if you're going into a polling station and you're happy where the economy is, it's stable, or you think Trump can keep it stable, great. If you think Biden can make the economy better, great. That's, that's really what's gonna drive this election in the end. It always does. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned values specifically. What, what do you think is, is the difference in values between the, the two sides? Well, I mean, the two sides and the, the two people or the two... Um, yeah, I guess you could say Trumpism and Bidenism, however you want to describe that. Yeah, sure. No, there's no question. One is a lot less government. One is a lot more government. You know, one is tax cuts. One is tax increases. Um, one is, you know, uh, uh, pro health care. The other one is, you know, changing the health care system. I mean, what's interesting is that what I think from 2016 to now, the issues have definitely become more defined. They're more clear, right? So there's not as much ambiguity, which is why I think you're seeing more people, you know, kind of being divisive um, because the, the positions are more clear. So the, the, the two individuals running these parties, um, are, are very much behind a lot of their, their issues. Now, again, what you don't have with President Trump is the ability to go back 47 years, like you know, Vice President Biden, and actually pick apart how many times he's flip-flopped, which ways has he gone? Because certainly, as all of us know, in politics, people change, just like in every other industry. So of course, positions are gonna change. But it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, when you're, you've only been in politics for four years, you don't have that record of kind of flip-flopping back and forth uh, on issues. So I think, you know, from a values perspective, you look at the issues, they're very defined, very clear and oriented. And I think people are really going to, you know, have a choice. Um, you know, just to give you one example, in 2016, what we experienced, and, and you might have seen too, the fascinating thing is, you know, we ended up, I think, with about 11% of Bernie Sanders voters. And we were even scratching our heads and we were like, why? Well, they only cared about one issue, putting an outsider in office. So it, it was fascinating that somebody that could kind of believe in socialism or, or socialist policies would care about that one single issue enough that they would go all the way over to the other side and not really focus on President Trump's policies, but still support him because having somebody, having an outsider in office meant more to them than what that individual might do from a policy perspective. Totally. Well, you also mentioned uh, COVID-19, and I'd probably be remiss if I didn't ask about the pandemic, just given that it's kind of a dominant animating force in all our lives. Um, so first, I'd just love to know, you know, what's, what's the pandemic been like for you? And then also, how would you assess uh, the government's response, which was obviously a key subject of the, the first two debates? Sure. So yeah, to break it down, you know, personally and politically, personally, I think not just for me, but I think for a lot of people, I know there's some maybe some moms and dads that disagree, but the time uh, that we've been able to spend with our families, the time that we've been able to build relationships that that, you know, where you're praise of school and sports and, you know, all sorts of other community activities. Um, it's been great to kind of step back and, and, and almost not have anything to do to an extent. Um, because it's been able to build the bonds. It's been able to encourage dialogue, you know, among parents and children uh, to spend time bike riding with them. So I think overall, it's been a fascinating thing to see. And I'm, I'm actually very curious to see what this is going to do to, uh, you know, families moving forward. I don't think you're going to see as many uh, moms and dads in offices uh, as you once did. And I think it's, you know, giving kids a new perspective too. Um, and again, we'll, we'll find out as time passes, but overall, I think the opportunity that's been, been granted to some extent, you know, it's been really neat to see people taking advantage of that. Um, obviously, you know, with the fact that it is a virus, it's also kept, you know, some family away um, because of, you know, elderly loved ones or, you know, people that are really sick. Uh, and, and that's been the hard part, you know, and, and, and watching, 
some families struggled through this. Um, politically, you know, I thought the vice president did probably a, uh, the best job I've seen so far of uh, laying out the administration's case for what they specifically did, both from a policy and substance point of view. Um, I think one of the things that struck me with this is that, you know, all the doctors and scientists couldn't even really get their hands around this. I mean, there was so much misinformation and disinformation right at the beginning that it was very frustrating, you know, as, as an American, and I'm sure in, in other countries as well, over what we should actually do. You know, one day masks work, the next day they don't. Uh, you know, the, the six feet is not enough. Uh, you need to do 10 feet social distancing. So I think we've all been through this in, in a way that we've had to learn as we've gone along. And, and, and for any situation, particularly a virus like this, I mean, it's obviously debilitating and crippling um, and certainly has presented you know, issues for the administration to deal with. And sure, could their communications be uh, different sometimes? Absolutely. Um, you, you know, the, the one thing that has, has kind of struck me is the media kind of tears into the Trump administration. You know, they always uh, would, would pit some of the doctors, you know, kind of against the president or the vice president. And I think the thing that we have to step back and look at, you know, and in the context of, of being braver angels is not to um, look at, so Dr. Fauci had one role, he's a scientist. He has to give best case, worst case scenario based on scientific data and what he knows. A president, the vice president, they have to think more broadly. They have to think, how's this gonna affect the economy? How's this gonna affect you know, the Navy sailing ships around the ocean or the Air Force flying planes in the air? And, and nobody I think has really uh, appreciated that or understood it. And, and I'm not just referring to the president even though he's taken a leadership, but even members on Capitol Hill, you know? Yeah. The thing about this is it, it is, it doesn't matter who you are, as we now found out, right? The president of the United States can get COVID. It's an equalizer. It shows how human we all are. And what we need to do as humans to really pull together, ultimately to beat this thing. And that's the only way that we're going to do it is by helping each other. I've seen more um, fascinating stories and, and feel good stories from local communities of people helping each other to try through this. Um, while we wait, and, and look, I don't think any government was prepared for this. Clearly, there were governments around the world that you know, were in worse shape than we were, uh, although we're, we're a big country. But I think that as we go on, it, we're going to learn. Look, there's going to be more mistakes. There's going to be a lot of learning. There's going to be a lot of success. Um, if anything, I think what the president has been able to do, specifically because of his CEO background, is kind of find a way to the vaccine. I mean, clearly, He's, he's pushing that so far forward so quickly, you know, that obviously there's some scientists saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, that, you know, medicine doesn't work like that. But you can see his drive in that situation. Mm. He wants to find a vaccine because he wants his country to get back up on its feet and move forward. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that one kind of inspiring effect of COVID is, is how it's empowered people to help each other and help communities. I think when it comes to Trump, you know, one thing that definitely concerns me is, you know, it, it came out that Trump was telling Bob Woodward in late January, you know, this is deadly. This is airborne. This can affect young people. And then in early March, he's saying, this is going to go down to zero. You know, it's going to go away like a miracle. Um, and I guess I understand to some extent the argument that we don't want to create panic, but there's just such a big um, mismatch to me and I think some others um, between that, you know, statement to Woodward and then what he's telling Americans, because he's, if he's telling Americans, you know, you don't need to be worried, it's going to go down to zero. I can understand how he might want to be reassuring. Uh, but I think in, in, in that instance, I think you, you want a president who's really going to level with folks and say, you know, okay, there's no need to, you know, uh, run around with your head cut off or, or you know, give in to fear. Um, but I think you want to give folks, um, you want to be straight with them. Do, do, you, do you get that argument? Does that, that ring true to you? Oh, absolutely. As an American citizen, you know, you want all the facts, as many of the facts as, as we can handle. I mean, we're going through this, not just on, on the pandemic level, but obviously many levels. With the Mueller investigation, there's that same application. 
tell everybody you know the truth to the extent that you know it and it, it'll help um there's no question presidents uh historically have always uh not shared as much information as they know whether they're being advised to or choose not to um you know i i don't know the the answer to that what i can say with respect to the woodward tapes is you know i believe there are more there's more i don't know how much you know uh was shared in that one specific clip or that one specific tape but i do know from my experience and what I saw, you know, with the president, if there's anything we know about him, he doesn't really hold back information. So my belief is that there's probably more there and, and, and hopefully, you know, the president will come out and, and kind of explain it. If it's about, you know, not creating a panic, certainly that's an argument that can be made. Now, whether every American agrees with it or not, you know, that's their choice. But, you know, from my perspective, you know, especially again, what I went through with the Mueller, government transparency is paramount to the success of our democracy. And if we don't have it from any president, uh, past or present, then I think it really creates uh, a scenario where democracy is, is undermined. So I, I agree with your statement. We need to get the facts out um, as much as possible because I think it'll help the American people. Totally. Um, all right, well, I have one more question because I think we're coming up on time here. You've talked a lot about the lessons uh, you've learned about government, the lessons you've learned about the Trump administration, the lessons you've learned about the Mueller investigation, and with this book, how you're hoping to share those lessons with the American people. Um, what are the lessons you've learned about yourself uh, over the past five years through all of this? Sure. I, I think one of the first is you have to step back and, um, you know, one of the hardest for me was um, putting career before family to a large extent, you know, thinking uh, that I, I, I needed to be, you know, kind of someone in the career world uh, that I didn't. And, and when you do that, you sacrifice time with family, you sacrifice building relationships. Uh, and I think those are extremely important, you know, particularly at a time, you know, with the pandemic. I mean, look at what we're trying to do. We're trying to connect, you know, with people um, because we just don't have as much social interaction uh, because of what that has done. And, and so for, for, for me, it's been, um, you know, just a, a, an opportunity to kind of go back and, you know, particularly with my faith, you know, um, you know, walking in my faith, you know, a lot more and, uh, and trying to look at what I want to do moving forward and how I can take some of these issues that I've become passionate about now and help other people. I think it's, it's important as we all tell our children, you know, make a better America, make better people, you know, go out and, 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 and help, uh, you know, others and, and use those experiences. I mean, obviously, you know, we've been through a lot, you know, uh, both uh, my family and, and me, we both, we've been through a lot as a country, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, unfortunate, you know, what, what, what has been very hard to kind of still process, Kieran, and I'm still working through it, is this idea that, you know, with the Mueller probe in particular, it kind of came the lightning rod where, you know, the, the, the Mueller investigation is, is going to be known, you know, it's probably the greatest crime perpetrated by Americans against Americans on American soil. And it's, it's really damaged our democracy and our country, you know, because of it. And the, the frustrating thing is, is our adversaries kind of get to watch from the sidelines and watch us tear our country apart from within. And, 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 and to your whole point, what you guys are trying to do as an organization, we've got to get past, you know, all this. Um, you know, it, it, another thing that I've learned is learning to deal with anger. You know, throughout this process, we, you know, we, my family, were a lot of angry people. There's a lot more that the American people don't know um, that they will, as we're finding out now on a, on, a, on a number of fronts, not just with the Mueller probe. But it's important, you know, not let that anger you know, destroy you. And, and anger is destructive. Um, I think Alan Simpson had one of the best quotes I've ever heard uh, at the funeral of, um, you know, George H.W. Bush. And, it, you know, it's hatred corrodes the container that carries it. And, I, you know, I try to say that every day because, you know, there are people out there that that need some just kind of encouragement or hope instead of this idea that we're, we're going down a, a very, very um, you know, divisive path in our country. And I'm hoping that we can find ways to bring people back together, uh, particularly politically. I hate seeing politics being the divider of all this. Mm. Well, I think that's the perfect note to end on. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your story. Uh, once again, the book is called Wicked Game. It's coming out next week. I'm sure Rick will be doing some more media. Uh, would love to get listeners thoughts on this episode send me your comments compliments and complaints 
we take it all. And uh, once again, Rick, thanks so much. Sure. Thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed it.